Thank you. Our next speaker is Lori Zoloff, who directs the Center for Bioethics, Science, and Society at the Northwestern University School of Medicine. Actually, I'm just a humble professor of religious studies at Northwestern University these days. Um, I want to say thank you very much for inviting me to come to speak today. I think it's important to have voices of religious scholars as a part of this debate. It was something that I missed in the, in the otherwise excellent Newfield Report. Um, I'm a scholar of ethics. I'm not a, a rabbi or a halakhic authority, so the views I express are my own when I reflect on religious ethics. I also want to say that the medium is the method. I actually had slides and a fancy computer business going on. It crashed which kind of added to my anxiety about the possibility of technology failing utterly. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. Um, but I, I am a moral philosopher, so I have you know, an outline as a backup. <laughs> the proposed experiment presents several issues to consider. The first problem is generation, generativity and infertility. One, in Abrahamic tradition, traditions, they all contain conflicting perspectives, to be sure. They hold different norms about family, loss, and faith. But it can be said that these Abrahamic scriptural traditions do share some perspectives. The texts that serve as the basis for reflection when we consider issues of reproductive science were shaped by and received within actual living communities, largely themselves shaped by scarcity and illness and uncertainty. In texts devoted to the elaboration of covenants and promises over generations, infertility is a central crisis, perhaps the central crisis, elaborated and repeated over and again. The fate of tiny infants, the yearning for fecundity, is a central anxiety for Jewish in Jewish and Christian thought. This attention to children and infants, it's the season of Moses, obviously, is one of the great gifts of a scriptural tradition, this deep attention to the fate of, of the vulnerable child. So this all creates traditions that are frankly pro-natalist and supportive of the acts of healing. Healing the sick and caring for the widow and orphans are signs of obedience to God's laws. Moreover, in particular, Jewish law is very wary about moral appeals to naturalness or to the perfection of the natural world. The human person has a job to do. It is to finish the work of creation. The warrant to heal is understood as mandated. One simply cannot stand unmoved by the blood of your neighbor. At times, even natural facticity can be subverted to serve human needs. What's, an, what's a Jewish studies talk without a quote from the Talmud? This is Shabbat 35b. Our rabbis taught, it once happened that a man's wife died and left a child to be suckled, and he could not afford to pay a wet nurse, whereupon a miracle was performed for him, and his teats opened like two teats of a woman, and he suckled his son. Rabbi Joseph observed, come and see how great was this man that such a miracle was performed on his account. <coughs> Said Abaya to him, on the contrary, how lowly was this man, and yet the order of creation was changed on his account. Rabbi Judah observed, come and see. How difficult are man's wants of, to be satisfied, and how the order of creation had to be altered for them. Now, however powerful this narrative is, and how remarkable that, and what a great story in the Talmud for this, this, this case, however powerful it is, and it is the dominant narrative in the Jewish tradition, to be sure, it is not an uncontested narrative. And there are critical caveats to the way in which humans enact their stewardship of the natural world. Thus, where there are strong warrants for the acceptance of any and all I IRT procedures in the name of healing and pronatalism in both the Jewish and Christian and many Muslim texts, there are significant questions raised within the texts themselves about our caution. For example, early Christians distinguished themselves by having a practice that emphasized the discipleship, the abandonment, actually, of families of origin, and the calling to live without marriage and without children. Early Christians created a role for women entirely outside the drama of infertility, and, un and, and created large systems of childhood education that were organized by childless priests and childless nuns. Childless, in this sense, is never seen as tragic, but is seen as part of a calling to God's, God's word. Two, while radical responses to infertility are used, um, are used in the Hebrew scriptures and in the Quran, surrogacy, fertility enhancing plants, etc., the scriptural account of radical solutions to infertility is problematized. The religious gaze is a glance to the side, as it were, it is interested, this gaze, in seeing the one who would otherwise be invisible. Hagar, the first surrogate mother, is a part of the story in Hebrew scripture, and it is she who memorably gives God the first name in the Torah. God is called the one who sees even me. She plays a dominant role in Islam. Her narrative is reenacted as a part of the Muslim pilgrimage ritual, the Hajj in Mecca. The servant women who act as surrogates to Jacob and, and Rebecca, Bilpah and Zilpah are named 
They give, they give birth to four of the ten tribes of Israel. Social justice in these scriptures demands attention and inclusion as mothers to these children. This capacity to include in our gaze all participants in childbirth should inform the direction of our concern to every single person involved in this complex procedure. The idea of ownership or possession is understood as a wrong relation to one's children. Consider the first child in Hebrew scriptures, Cain. He is named by his mother. His name is the Hebrew word for acquisition, and it is understood that that's a big problem. Children are not commodities. They are strangers. They are strangers who we welcome into the world. Yet there are clear and basic norms about identity, legacy, and parenthood. Jewish texts do not valorize the idea of a right of a woman to have a child. Rather, they tend to focus on the duty of people to have families, understood as being fruitful and multiplying, and halakhically interpreted as having at least two children. However, even this is understood complexly. Adoption of orphans is the subject of concerns in the Talmud, and the duties to have students in many cases parallel the duties of parenthood. In some cases, these two activities ameliorate the duty to have children of one's own. Infertility can be grounds after a decade for divorce in Jewish law, but even in antiquity, this was rarely enacted. A child inherits the tribal status of his father, Kohan Levi, Israelite, but is only halakhically Jewish if his or her mother is a Jew. Adopted children in both Islam and Judaism maintain the identity of their own fathers. In contemporary Israel, IVF babies are complicated. They're considered the children of the women who gives birth to them, but for some rabbinic authorities, they're also considered the, 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 the children of the women who offer their genetic heritage to them. The genetic lineage can also be considered parenthood. Some legal constraints in the Salakic system emerge. The concern for Jewish thinkers is largely about the problem of incest, a situation uniquely created by sperm donation plus anonymity. A core difference in an Abrahamic face concerns the moral status of these in vitro embryos. For Muslims and Jews, genetic manipulation that is done on embryos is permissible because such entities have very little moral status. Moral status is acquired through pregnancy and finally only achieved at birth. A barrier to this research is that it is considered problematic to risk one's life in Jewish traditions, and perhaps, by extension, the life of one's unborn child. Risk aversion meant that even such interventions as normal organ transplantation, heart transplants, for example, had to be considered safe and tried over and over. They had to be considered routine before they were permissible in Jewish law. And finally, since this sort of manipulation has the aim of addressing an illness that may be life-threatening, it could be warranted as an extension of the duty to heal. <coughs> And for both these reasons, it would appear to be technically permissible within halakhic traditions that have already accommodated the wide range of ARTs. But there's a second problem. There is more to say. And there is a, a Jewish response that's suggested by these halakhic, by these halakhic restric restrictions. Because the issue in this case is not really infertility. It is the totally understandable yearning to have two things at once. First, a child who is a genetic product of the parents produced by using the nuclear DNA. And second, a child who has mitochondrial DNA that is without the sequences that the mother possesses, which may or may not lead to disability or death. Then we must engage sources and moral arguments distinct from the ones that I just said that support creating families or even creating pregnancies to create families. For it touches on the worth of disabled persons, on the concept of risk, both immediate and proximal, the issue of human finitude, the meaning of illness, normality, and the contextual issues the healthcare marketplace and the selling and exchanging of human gametes provides, and the larger issue, of course, of social justice. To consider these issues, we need to turn to the idea of lifnei mishmurat habdin, to act beyond the letter of the law. We need to ask, are there limits to our acts if they will affect future generations? What points ought we to consider before we support an action that will take us beyond the carefully constructed bright line that was created by ethicists in 2000, um, in, uh, in calling for a moratorium on IGM. What are the limits on human activity, even good human activity, set by the need for justice? So first points to consider about the argument itself. I'm troubled that there are some logical contradictions in the argument for the experiment. First, if we're to accept the concept that the ipsity of the human person, the very being, the part of embodiment that is really significant is the, is the nuclear DNA, that we have accepted an idea that is quite correlative to the Aristotelian idea of the homunculus, an idea that's based on an agricultural metaphor, that, that being is a self-generating seed planted in any fertile soil. This concept had such resonance that it endured throughout the medieval period, linked to the idea of the embodied soul, that is so strong that even after microscopes showed eggs and sperm, 17th century scientific drawings show the sperm as a small baby with a long tail. This idea is problematic for many reasons, and in, in not the least of which is the creation of a secular version 
of a central problem in Catholic moral theology. But if we're to reify this nuclear DNA in this particular way, then why is it permissible to discard the tiny total being the ipsity of another woman's fertilized egg? If the goal is to have a child without the chance of a genetic anomaly, why is it acceptable to create an embryo which has such a high risk of anom anomaly at the very site of the problem? And it's said that the number of em em empty DNA genes is very small. Sometimes their contribution is described as minimal or quite small, and other times it's clear that even a tiny mutation in one allele is catastrophic. Clearly in genetics, even small changes matter, and we must consider this. There are three linguistic problems as well. The term donor is used repeatedly. The term obscures, this term obscures the nature of the transaction at stake, obscures the gender and class context of the American marketplace and gametes. It obscures the process by which the eggs are obtained, a chemical and surgical intervention with unknown long-term risks. The correct term in most cases would be egg seller, unless an actual donation is made. The term therapy and treatment is used. This obscures the reality that the project proposed is a phase one clinical trial. It uses, unlike most trials, the most vulnerable of populations. It is an experiment which would be need to be made clear that both the women involved, all the women involved, and the child anticipated are involved in a trial whose primary outcome is scientific knowledge. This violation of clear Kantian imperatives, never to use a human being as a means to an end, is usually resolved with informed consent. We've also talked about how difficult that is. First use in human experiments are in many ways a tragedy. They are a tragic moral gesture. This is not only because they largely fail, but because they must be undertaken with no expectation really of success. To engage in such a trial is not a solution. And in this case, it is only the entrance to a multi-generational open question. This uncertainty is not tangential, it is part of the moral act of participation. Um, I have many more things to say, my time is up, and I'll submit this to you in written form. Thank, Thank you. you very much.